Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Wyoming PBS sits down with new University of Wyoming President Ed Seidel in his first statewide televised interview. President Seidel has inherited enormous challenges, including massive budget pressures, the impacts of COVID-19, and the push for athletics to return to competition. How has all of this impacted the crown jewel of academia in Wyoming? UW President Ed Seidel, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. And thank you so much for joining us on this very special Wyoming Chronicle. We are pleased to be joined by the 28th president of the University of Wyoming, Dr. Ed Seidel. Mr. President, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thanks so much, great to be here. We have a lot to talk about today. I mean, this university, like all universities, are impacted by COVID, um, made tough decisions about athletics, certainly struggling with budget issues, and we'll get to all of that in our discussion. But I wanna talk about you and your history here just a little bit. Um, you came from the Illinois college system. What has appealed to you, I guess, about this position? Recruiting is always a two-way street, as they say. The university expressed interest in you, but you expressed interest in the university. I had my eye on this place as soon as I knew the job was open. I've, I've been to Wyoming many times as a tourist. I've always wanted to live in a place that had mountains and sort of a, a culture like Wyoming has. And uh, when it was open, I just really went for it. So there wasn't any salesmanship on their side to convince me. It was more the other way around. I look at the University of Illinois website and I only see skyscrapers in Lake Michigan pretty mm -hmm. much and the, what was formerly called the Sears Tower. And if we were to look out our windows today, we would see you know, Sherman Hills and the summit. So it, it couldn't be any different for you. It's very different, but I, was, I lived in Champaign, which is about two hours south of the skyscrapers, but I did also work at the system level. So we had three universities in Champaign, which is covered in soybeans and, and corn, and just it's very, very flat, but, but, very, but not very high. So the highest buildings as on this campus were basically some of the dormitories there. Um, but of course, Chicago is a, is a world city, and then Springfield is, a, is another uh, smaller town, but the capital. But um, this is a wonderful place to live, and I've just really always wanted to live near mountains. I'm a skiing fanatic. I love hiking. We've gone hiking almost every weekend. We've gone camping. We've, we've gone in, in every direction. We just love it here. You have an immense education um, background in science. You have a PhD in relativistic astrophysics. Maybe if you could expand upon that just for a little bit. I'm guessing there aren't many Wyomingites who have a, a PhD in relativistic astrophysics. Well, you never know. They're all over the place, actually. In <laughs> fact, the, the department here in physics has a lot of people who are expert in, in astrophysics. So it's one of the specialties here. So I feel very much at home in the physics department. Uh, my specialty has been in science has been around black holes and and uh, supercomputing. I kind of moved into that over time. Uh, the people who just won the Nobel Prize uh, yesterday in, in physics, I know some of them because they were black hole experts. And it's been, a, it's been a wild ride to be in that field at this time. You have a master's in philosophy and also in physics and a, and a BS in mathematics and physics. Mm -hmm. Speaking of supercomputing, you had a lot to do years ago with locating NCAR here in Wyoming. I did. I just by a, a kind of a funny coincidence, um, I forget when it was, around 2007, I was asked to chair a committee to recommend to the NSF what they should do about the supercomputing facilities for the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is located in Boulder. And we looked at a lot of possibilities, and, and our committee recommended very strongly that Cheyenne, Wyoming would be a great location for this. And of course, the university has a great relationship with, with what happens mm -hmm. there. Right. Your and I'd like to build on that, by the way. Oh, and we'll have a chance to talk mm -hmm. about that here in just a minute. Your first impressions, Mr. President, of the public support around Wyoming for the University of Wyoming. It's phenomenal. People love the university. Of course, there are a lot of different opinions about what the university should do, but I think that's normal if you have such a strong base of supporters. People are interested in different aspects of what the university can do. But I, it was one of the things that attracted me to the university was the fact that it is the only four-year 
public university in the state, and it has such support, and it's been very generously supported by, by the state over many years, and so it's built a great foundation. And we'll talk about that support and the, the fiscal pressures that the mm -hmm. university is, is feeling here in just a little bit, but I think some people wonder, and I would say it's a minority of folks in Wyoming, but people do criticize the university for maybe trying to save coal. What is your um, thought about coal's future and things like carbon sequestration and other things, and why is it important, if not the University of Wyoming, who else to maybe do some of this research? Well, I agree with that totally. The University of Wyoming has very strong research groups in, uh, in everything around coal, mining, uh, other, other related science, for, for example, you mentioned carbon sequestration. That is a national problem, it's not just a Wyoming problem, and it's not only around coal. And there are lots of universities, not only across the country, but around the world, that have expertise in all aspects of this, how to, how to make uh, coal uh, 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 clean for the uh, atmospheric emissions with, with carbon as one of the biggest uh, problems that, that can create. But then there are a lot of technologies that are allowing us to reduce that. And it is an asset that the state has. And it's an asset that the country, in fact, other countries have as well. We are actually developing a partnership with the uh, University of Cardiff in Wales that has tr tr traditionally also had uh, a lot of coal uh, and also sheep um, as uh, the driver of the economy there. And so there are a lot of areas where we can work and, and try to advance uh, the technologies and think about the impact on the economy. There are some Wyomingites maybe some things that Wyomingites don't understand about the University of Wyoming, and as you've started to get around the state, maybe been hindered a little bit because of COVID, mm -hmm. what are some things that you've noticed that maybe Wyomingites really don't understand about the university? Well, I think for the most part, people really understand the, the lifeblood that it is for the state. It, it educates the students of the state. It gives opportunities that students and, uh, and young people just wouldn't have without the University of Wyoming. I've met with a lot of the students here who in some cases had thought about going elsewhere to other universities, but they come here and they love it. And then they're experiencing things that they just wouldn't have otherwise. For example, we have a terrific international program. So many of our students through the Cheney uh, International Center and the support from the Cheneys are able to go to, to London or to Italy or to Germany or other parts of the world. And they come back with their just eyes wide open from what they've seen there. So we have a lot of opportunities here, but I think maybe what people don't understand is the university has a very strong research program that feeds directly into the future of the economy of the state. And I spent my last four years actually in Illinois, or four and a half years as the uh, vice president for economic development. So I think a lot about the importance of the university for the future of the economy of the state. And I have a lot of thinking about what we can do with partners across the state that the university can lead in order to help advance the economy of the state. What were the board of trustees telling you maybe in suggesting to you and, and communicating with you that sh should be your top initial priorities here? Well, I think priorities from the day I interviewed, uh, which is in the end of February or the week I interviewed, um, there were a lot of questions, but none of them were about COVID-19 or about um, cutting budgets or about what to do about the athletics program in this situation. So those have been my initial priorities is to just deal with the, the hand that you're dealt, which wasn't necessarily one you were expecting. But of course, longer term, we did talk a lot about the, the future of the economy and what the university can do to help advance that in partnership with community colleges. I'm, I'm very, very big on building partnerships with, uh, with other institutions across the state and I've already had conversations with many of them. The board's very supportive of that. Also thinking about um, where the university should go as a, as a 21st century land grant university. There's a lot we can do there. We have to modernize some of our programs, particularly around computing. Um, computing impacts every facet of our lives. The university can grow in those areas. Of course, NCAR Wyoming is a, is a great asset to build on, but there's a lot more we can do. Corporate partnerships as well, providing more opportunities for our students for, uh, for the jobs that they'll, that they'll actually need to be prepared for in the next five to 10 years. Those will be very different from the jobs that people are looking at even now. And you're suggesting probably jobs with big data or artificial intelligence or those types of jobs, I'm guessing. Those are absolutely essential. And to think about, well, there's been a lot of buzz about artificial intelligence. So it's not just uh, a computer science activity. It's something that impacts agriculture with unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. You can fly drones around. They're incredibly sophisticated. I just, <laughs> I just bought a drone with Gabrielle 
um, and it is so sophisticated. It can go 11 miles and you can program it. And it's, it's in fact so sophisticated. We've had it for a month and I don't think we know how to turn it on yet. So <laughs> we're still studying the, the manual. But the point is this, this can actually revolutionize the existing economies of the state around agriculture, or around mining, or uh, even around tourism and ecology. There's just a lot of technology that can advance all of those areas. You've talked publicly um, about the four pillars that will drive mm -hmm. the university forward. Expand on that, if you will. Sure. So one of them is around computing and, and becoming more digital. And I mean that in a couple of different ways. So we want to be able to have more online courses so we can reach people in rural areas. And so we can educate people regardless of where they live or regardless of what stage they are in their careers. It may be impossible for them to come to Laramie, so we'll try to reach them where they are. So that's one aspect of it. The other is we just have to have more computation and more uh, digital techniques in our instruction here on the campus so that students are exposed to advances in artificial intelligence or big data or supercomputing, simulation and modeling. And those may sound like very technical things, but they apply to every discipline on the campus, whether it's literature, the arts, if it's civil engineering, if it's about extraction, it, you know, energy, it, it, it's revolutionizing every single industry. So we have to grow in those areas. So that's, that's the first pillar that I talk about. The second pillar is talking about being more entrepreneurial. And I have two meanings for that as well. We want the faculty to be entrepreneurial in terms of getting more sources of revenue for their research programs and for students and so on. This means more focus on corporate partnerships, becoming more, uh, more ag aggressive about applying for grants from the National Science Foundation, where I, I worked for four years, or the Department of Energy or the National Institutes of Health, or going out to foundations for funding from the Gates Foundation or the MacArthur Foundation, or working with people who want to give money to the university. That's going to be an important part growing, growing our philanthropy. So that's more entrepreneurial from the faculty point of view. But another meaning of that is training our students so they've got the skills they need in order to build businesses. And so this is something that we're in fact rolling out a minor so that students in any major, whether it's English or you know, energy or civil engineering, they can learn the skills that they need in order to try to build a business. So that's, that's the second pillar. The third pillar is to become more interdisciplinary. University is already very good at, at being able to combine the expertise that we have across all the different departments. Uh, but what we really want to do is to focus the expertise of the university on Wyoming's problems. So Wyoming has, has problems and it has opportunities and they involve expertise in legal affairs and in business and in engineering and in the arts and humanities. And so how do we combine all of that so that we can really focus on providing solutions to the problems of Wyoming? And the fourth pillar I have is on becoming more inclusive. So we wanna make sure that people from all parts of the state, from all walks of life, from all ethnic groups, from all income brackets have an opportunity to be students here to be welcome, to succeed. And then if you have people from different backgrounds, they look at things in different ways. And so that leads to innovation. You come up with better ideas for the solutions that we need for the state. I wanna turn the page to COVID, mm -hmm. um, Mr. President, if we can. UW's enrollment is down a little bit, mm -hmm. not as much as many maybe thought it might be a little, mm -hmm. about three and a half percent or so, mm -hmm. if I recall the numbers. Right. Um, certainly CARES Act funding maybe has helped prop that up a little bit. Are you concerned about second semester, Mr. President? And, uh, and the, the student experience here certainly isn't what students thought it might be with COVID. How's the university doing in response to the, the virus? Well, I think overall we're doing quite well. We've taken a quite uh, strong approach to testing and, uh, and the kinds of interventions that we need to take in order to make sure that students and faculty and staff are safe and also that the community is safe. I, I get a lot of concern from the community about the students bringing coronavirus into this sure. really wonderful uh, environment that we live in in Laramie. So we're, we're taking many, many interventions. We have many working groups that are, uh, that are uh, going all the time. I get daily reports, in fact, uh, as many as three times a day, I'm getting reports on, on the status of, of the situation here on the campus. And I think we're managing it actually quite well. I'm, I'm actually quite proud of it. Um, but I'll say that, um, uh, in fact, to the, to the point that you made when you started the question, about the student body uh, here and the number of students we have that are, are coming for this semester. 
I am very happy that we were able to get CARES Act funding to help support students, thanks to Governor Gordon and, and support from the legislature, there was a, there was a, there were several approaches to, to making sure the funding could be available. So we have uh, more than $20 million that's been made available to our students, up to $3,250 to cover living expenses for students who are in some way uh, having difficulty finding the, the financial resources in order to attend college this uh, semester. And that did help us dramatically increase the enrollment. We were looking at something like 15 to 20% downturn in our student enrollment, as many universities were. And then we put in this program and uh, now we're only down three and a half percent. And I think that's a big success. You had many faculty that wanted to teach only online um, um, before the semester started. <clears throat> and I just have to wonder is, uh, you know, this online experience can't be what most students want from a university, either here or anywhere in the country. Um, is this still an effective means of providing an education? Well, I think online instruction can be effective. Uh, and, and there are many programs, there are universities that are entirely online. In fact, um, uh, many universities, even some of the, the most expensive private universities, the Ivy League, for example, uh, have gone primarily online. Uh, Johns Hopkins University went completely online, in fact, on a moment's notice. I mean, but they're in different situations. They're in places, for example, in Johns Hopkins, I have uh, colleagues and friends there. I had a long call with them about uh, their situation. Why did they go online? They have one of the best medical schools in the world. Uh, if any university could, could stay safe, you might think it would be Johns Hopkins. But of course, there's a lot of coronavirus in their neighborhood, and they said basically they couldn't keep it out. We're in a different situation. We're living in a state that has uh, been uh, blessed by having smaller numbers of, of coronavirus. Of course, we have a smaller population. It's not felt nearly as much here as it is in some other places. And we were committed from the beginning, since I got here certainly, and I know uh, President Theobald was as well, to having an on-campus experience where we could stay open. But in order to do that, we had to put in place a very, very comprehensive testing program. So currently, all students are being tested once a week. Uh, virtually all students, not not actually every, absolutely every student. Seventy five percent or so. Yes, mm -hmm. right. And then faculty and staff that have high contact with students, and we're looking to grow that. the The best studies of epidemiology are showing that you need to test all of the students where most of the coronavirus actually is is being found. Over ninety percent of the positives are due to students who are infected. They don't all show it. In fact, only only about 25% even have symptoms, but they're still contagious if they have sure. it. So we're trying to put in place a program that allows us to stay open so we do have that on-campus experience, and we're dedicated to trying to make sure that happens. Even so, anecdotally, I hear stories of, uh, of kids who are in dorms and certainly don't have the life that they envisioned maybe mm -hmm. two years ago or even a year ago. Right. They're lonely. Mm -hmm. Does the university have the supports in place to help those students? We have over 200 staff who are working at least part-time and many of them full-time on every aspect from monitoring the situation to understanding what interventions we might take to looking at the health aspects to also the student life. Uh, our, our vice president for student mental affairs. Mental health aspects as well. Mental health mm -hmm. aspects as well. And in fact, uh, our student affairs uh, VP Kim, Kim Chestnut is absolutely dedicated, uh, many of you will, will know her, she's just wonderful, has a completely dedicated staff. Um, we're, for students who are found to be positive that have to go through isolation or they might, might or, or if they may be quarantined, if they may have been exposed to this, we constantly are checking up on them. I've talked to some of the, the mothers and fathers of some of the students and some of the students who've been impacted, making sure that they get the, the uh, brand of potato chips they want if they need it. You know, so we've had food deliveries. Sure. We're, we're trying to do everything we can. It's a tough time for sure. Mm -hmm. Let's turn the page to, to budget. Um, I've asked several around campus to, to tell me about campus morale relative mm -hmm. to budget. And a, word, and a word that comes up with COVID is crazy, mm -hmm. but it's all over the board. And um, what I'm curious about is you have to bring forward over $40 million of budget cuts here in the next month. What process are you using to making sure you're getting that as right as it can be? And also then, what are the long-term implications here? We have really, really pulled out all the stops to get people involved and give us their best ideas. So I, even before I came here uh, in June, 
I started July 1st, but I created a budget re reduction working group that started at the end of June that began to look at different ways we might try to develop budget cuts. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I, I talked about these four pillars. So I, I'm working very hard to say, it's not just cut things that you think maybe should be cut, but cut things that allow us to continue to build towards these four pillars so that we can be as valuable as possible back to the state. So we're looking at ways uh, at certain programs. So er some things will have to stop because we just can't afford to do them with the budget cut. So we're looking at programs that don't have the kind of impact that, uh, that uh, would have impact on the future of the state. We're looking at uh, the way we might reorganize activities. For example, some departments may be combined because there could be economies of scale of bringing them together that could create stronger units out of potentially weaker units. Some, some units were weakened from the budget cuts we had three years ago before I got here. And then we're looking at uh, how to set the table so that we can grow in the future around these areas of computing and entrepreneurship and interdisciplinarity that will make us more competitive, for example, for the big grants from the NSF, looking on the revenue side as well, mm -hmm. looking at ways so that we will be able to bring in more revenue going forward. Some people may have just heard you articulate that and thought to themselves, well, there go humanities. What's your response? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big humanities fan. Humanities are absolutely essential. Uh, it's not just as a service course that students have to learn English and history and social sciences, which they do, but they contribute to the vitality of the, uh, of the community here. And uh, imagine uh, a student who's a, a Shakespeare scholar but has a minor in entrepreneurship, so they understand both the human condition and how to build a business. I mean, those are fantastic skills for 21st century, so th those will be important for us. And I wish you the best. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Um, if you've, you've talked earlier about your relationship with community colleges, and full disclosure, I'm actually an employee of Central Wyoming College. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And I wonder, are there discussions on how the university and the community colleges will evolve from this that might have the university and the community colleges having a different, perhaps more efficient relationship in, in some view? And can you articulate anything about that? I can. Uh, so I'm a... I'm a huge fan of partnerships. Uh, when I was in Illinois, I helped build partnerships, well, some with the community colleges, but, uh, with, but we have 12 public universities in the state of Illinois. So we built partnerships with all of them and we, there were things we could do together that were stronger than what we could do alone. And I have the same approach here. So I've had a conversation with every community college president, including today I just did, uh, and, and we'll be visiting, uh, we're going to Powell tomorrow for the, uh, the, the summit of articulation between the, the community colleges and the, uh, and the University of Wyoming. We're working very hard to build stronger pipelines and uh, better uh, pathways, let's say, for students from the community colleges to the University of Wyoming to make it much easier for students to, to come to the university uh, if they wish to, uh, and then to provide compelling opportunities. We're also talking about trying to um, augment the curriculum at the community colleges, either through direct collaboration, for example, with Central Wyoming College. We've talked about several things from um, culinary uh, studies and hospitality to entrepreneurship and big data. We're, we're having conversations. Last week in Jackson, we had conversations specifically with Central Wyoming College people about exactly that. Um, we're also looking at ways, for example, to augment uh, computer science and software engineering at the community colleges through uh, partnerships that we might have with external universities. And so I think you'll see some initial steps within the next few months that might surprise people about how well we're able to work together. Athletics. Mm -hmm. On everyone who's watching this is mind. Um, you took some heat, quite frankly, um, Dr. Seidel, initially about supporting the Mountain West Conference's decision to not play a fall season. Um, and now it's, it's turned 180, and here we go with Cowboy football, which a lot of people are excited about. Me too. <laughs> yeah, and, and certainly I am as well. Um, how has that process evolved? Is it evolving safely? Is it the right choice? What's changed between then and now? A lot has changed. So first of all, it is true that I've, I've had, uh, perhaps from some of the viewers here, I've had some emails and some phone calls that uh, uh, were, let's say, a bit harsh. I, I felt so, but, it, but I understand. There's, it comes from passion. It comes from passion and support for the team and for the university. So I understand that. I think maybe people didn't understand because uh, they didn't know me. I mean, I came from the Big Ten. I'm a huge sports fan. Uh, I, I know the, the uh, AD at uh, University of Illinois, Josh Whitman, very well, many, many conversations. In fact, I consulted with him a lot when I, when I came here. And I was once at LSU. 
So um, my first uh, year at LSU, we won the national championship. And that led to, through a kind of a bizarre set of circumstances, it led to my picture being in the sports page of the New York Times, because Mark Emmert, who's the head of NCAA, sure. mm -hmm. was the chancellor at the time, and he wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times, and it says, look, we're great in football, but we're great in academics too. Look who we just recruited. And so then that just immediately showed me the spotlight that a university can be in by having the kind of uh, sports program that really uh, attracts attention. And so that attracts donors, it attracts students, it attracts funding, and it gets a lot of momentum around the university. So these things are all important in addition to the, the athletics program itself. So I really understand that. But at the time, it was, I uh, would say, unanimous among at least the medical advisors to the teams that there wasn't a safe path forward. And that was largely because the testing uh, technologies were not advanced enough. But with advances in testing technology, and then with a sort of an about face of some of the other conferences, for example, the Big Ten among others, um, we looked very hard at what could be done. And that it's, it's now feasible to test the team members three times per week, which is what we will do. The money will be provided through the Mountain West Conference. And so we're able to do that. And this changed the game. And so this is how we decided to, to change, uh, uh, to do an about face and, and then have the season open again. We have just a couple minutes left, mm -hmm. Dr. Seidel. Is Wyoming competing in the conference that it belongs in? Oh, I think it's very important for us to be in the Mountain West. I think right now, at least, it's good for us. There were, there were a number of people who said maybe we should bolt out and just play on our own. But, of course, there was no one to play if you're not in the conference. So sure. for now, at least, I'm committed to Division I sports, and, and Mountain West is good for us. This is a weird year by anyone's mm -hmm. explanation and examination. What do you hope students take away from this year at this place here in Laramie? Oh, there are a lot, a lot of things. I hope that, uh, and I think it's generally true, that the students feel like they're being supported by the university to get through a very complex time in our history. I mean, this is a once in a century event. And Let's I, hope so. I hope so, right, exactly. And I hope next time, if, if it comes less than a century from now, we'll be better prepared. We have many things in place. We understand much better how these viruses are, are transmitted and, and the interventions that can be taken. But, you know, I mean, there are hard knocks in life, and uh, I think it's, it's good to get uh, some exposure to this early on so that you can understand you can get through this. So I hope what happens is uh, we get through this, students say, I survived that, I, I know how to handle adversity, and I know how to get past this. And so I think that we'll, that'll be a good experience in the long run for a lot of people in the long run. Well, I think I speak for many and certainly many alum as I am. Best wishes, Dr. Thank you Seidel. Very much. And we really appreciate your time today on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.